Let's pray together as we go to God's word. Gracious Father, as we've gathered here to worship you, we come before your throne of grace with humble hearts and ask, Lord, that you will pour out your spirit upon our lives just now. Draw us, Father, with your gentleness into a closer relationship with you. Speak to us, Father, from your sacred word this morning, that, Father, our hearts and our lives might be in tune with you, we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. It is an absolutely incredible story in Acts chapter 2, isn't it? Oh, that we could experience the same thing. And we highlight Acts chapter 2 as being the pivotal chapter in the birth of the Christian church. And we call it the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as the early church was born. 3,000 souls were added to that church that day. It's an incredible story, isn't it? But we must look at it just for a few minutes today again. We've looked at it up to the time and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit a couple of weeks ago. If you have your Bibles, open them to Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Because between Acts chapter 2, verse 23 and Acts chapter 2, verse 36, there's an amazing uh, condensed story going on here. There's the complete great controversy contained in 13 verses of Scripture, just to set the context of this setting. Acts chapter 2, verse 23, he was handed over by God's set plan and foreknowledge, and you, by the hands of the lawless, lawless, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. What a charge, and what a condemnation. What a proclamation that through the lawlessness of those who brought charges against Christ, they nailed him to the cross. I don't know how it is in your life, friends. I know how it is in mine. When somebody does something that is wrong against me, at times I'm not real charitable. What I want is not forgiveness for them, but a bit of justice, a bit of equality, a bit of awareness of what they have done. So it's been a very short time just weeks since Jesus was crucified. But the goodness of God is poured out. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore let all of Israel, all of Israel, God's chosen people as they're called, be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. What a stark contrast. Hanging on the cross, uh, they crucified him. And just a few verses later, God is proclaiming that it is this Jesus who your sins, he hung on the cross, your lawlessness, you crucified him. Let it be clearly known to the Jews and Gentiles alike, both Lord and Messiah. He died on the cross that you might have forgiveness of sin. Can you say amen? amen. It is this goodness and grace that in these few verses we find the fullness of God's love for us. In Acts chapter 2, 
goes on to proclaim, What shall we do then? They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do then? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. There is no place to go to find repentance, friends, except to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Holy Spirit calls you to repentance, there is no place you can go but to find the fullness of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, but to the cross of Christ. Repent and be baptized. The scripture makes it clear. In the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, verse 38 says, For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. If the call was valid then, the call is valid today. Do you believe that, friends? If they lived in a perverse generation... Over 2,000 years ago, how would you describe the generation that we are living in today? If open sin magnified itself openly in those days, how much more so does sin abound today? We are in deep need of that repentance and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and forgiveness and baptism anew by the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that, friends? I believe that today. However, the baptism is only the starting place in living for Jesus today. Many people say, I've asked Christ to forgive my sins. I've been baptized. My name is on the church books. Things are right between me and the Lord, and everything is good. Being saved from this perverse generation and receiving the word of God in forgiveness. There were 3,000 souls added to the church. They were continually devoting them themselves to five things, five keys in Christian growth that I believe, if we will examine our lives, they provide the fullness of a strong relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one thing to be part of the family of God. It's another thing to be growing in goodness and grace. It's another thing to be having your soul fed on a daily basis. Some people say, well, you know, I've given my heart to the Lord and that's all that I need to do and to walk in his goodness and grace. I liken it on to the person that says, you know, I'd like to run a marathon and all they ever do is think about it. How far do you think they get? They say that Santa Clarita Marathon is scheduled sometime in November. I'll wait until October to prepare for that marathon. And I'll take off right out of the starting block, and I'll make it through mile one, and mile two, and mile three, and four, maybe. And that's sometimes how the Christian life goes. I'll give my heart to the Lord, I'll be baptized, and somewhere after the first trial, second trial, third trial, fourth trial, it's just too much. And the ways of the world and the temptations of sin and the troubles of life press in, and we find ourselves drifting away from the Lord. Does the scripture speak to that? How is it that scripture admonishes that we can grow in the Lord? So let's look at the five keys. Four of them are readily obvious in that verse. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. If you want to scribe some notes, you can take one of the bulletin inserts that are blank and jot the five keys down along with a text that I'll share with you today. The first key is they found themselves devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings or biblical teachings. You see that as Jesus went about 
through Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manners of sickness and all manners of diseases among the, uh, among the people. There is a teaching element. If there is teaching from the scripture, it needs to, it needs to penetrate our hearts and our lives that we are growing in the teachings of the scriptures daily. There are a lot of world philosophies out there. There are a lot of competing ideas. There are a lot of things that are called wisdom of the day. There are a lot of prevailing philosophies. All you need to do is this or that. The place that I want to base my life on and live my life according to is the clear teachings of the Word of God. That's where we find safety today. That's how we can construct our lives in a way that are, and live our lives in a way that is pleasing to God. Jesus went about all of Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching. Verse, Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, jot the reference down. There's a warning in the scriptures, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrines, the commandments of what? of men. Rather than teaching the things of God, rather than teaching the things that are clearly proclaimed in the scriptures and walking in the ways, they teach for the things of God the doctrines of what? Of men. Have you heard, the, have you heard that done by others? They proclaim that world philosophy says if you want to grow into a closer relationship with God, just follow the latest trend. And here it is. And it proclaims to be words of God, but it's words of wisdom from men. And they violate the teachings of God and the clear laws of God. And in vain do they worship me, the scripture says. Teaching the, for doctrines the commandments of men. There are Bible teachings, friends, that God makes perfectly clear. It's not the things that I don't understand, one writer has said in Scripture. It's the things that I do understand that cause me the most trouble. Do you believe that to be the case? You see, the Scripture is not so deep and, and not so difficult to understand, but the Holy Spirit will guide you and lead you into the clear teachings of God and as we walk in them our faith grows and our faith deepens in the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 28 20 says teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you and lo I am with you always even unto the end. Continually daily in biblical teaching the apostles teaching. Colossians 1.28 says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we might present every person perfect in Christ Jesus. Teaching everybody what the scripture says about bringing our lives not into the will of our own will, but following the will of Christ for our lives. Colossians says, let the word of Christ, 3, chapter 3, verse 16, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. As that, as that teaching comes into our hearts and into our lives, how it changes our outlook on the world, how it fills our lives with song and goodness and grace, and we lift our hearts in praise to the Lord Jesus. Titus says in Titus 2.12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, we should live righteously and godly in this present world. Can you say amen? If we're going to live a robust Christian life for our Lord Jesus Christ, the first key is to listen to the teachings of Scripture and the apostles. The second piece, I believe, if we're going to live a robust Christian life, is found in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. 
they devoted themselves continually to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Do you like to fellowship? I like to fellowship. There's nothing like getting to know one another better. Now, some of you are a little more outgoing and a shade on the gregarious side, and some of you are a little more shy. Some of you like to lead a conversation, and some of you like to listen to the congregation. So it's not about personality, it's not about style of communication, but it's about just fellowshipping with one another. God is faithful by whom you are called on to fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Fellowshipping first with Christ, as 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 admonishes us. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, That which we have seen, which we have heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship first with the Son, then fellowship with one another. For 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Fellowship with Christ, walking in the light, fellowshipping with one another, and having cleansing from sin. To keep the fellowship in Christ and one another is the second key. So we find abiding, abiding in the teaching of Scripture, fellowshipping with one another. The third key is breaking of the bread together. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says, And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship in breaking bread and in prayers. It's the breaking of bread symbolizing the communion service, the broken body for Christ, the spilled blood of Jesus representing the, by the Jews. It's coming together to celebrate that communion. But I believe it transcends that even. It's breaking the common bread together also. There's nothing like sitting around a table and partaking of some good food. How many of you like to eat? I've been accused once of being born with cardboard taste buds. My taste buds did not wake up until about five years ago. And when they woke up, I quit eating for nutrition. I like to eat. And my favorite food is usually the food that is on the plate in front of me. And it is good. It doesn't matter whether I'm in a four-star restaurant or four food groups on my plate. And let me tell you, we have some of the best cooks in Santa Clarita in our church. And if you don't believe me, you come to a half a dozen potlucks. And I will guarantee you that five and a half of them will be very good. Given that, you know, good is defined by your taste buds. But more than the food is the fellowship that happens around those tables. Now here's a little clue. When you're fellowshipping around the table, there's something about just... If you're not quite sure what to do, just enjoy the food for a while. And then ask somebody to the left of you or to the right of you, share with me your story. That's a little different inquiry than, let me tell you about what I learned, all 62 chapters of the scripture as you eat. A little difference, isn't there? Share with me what's new in your life. Tell me your story. And just get acquainted with the fabric and texture of their life. For you see, none of us here are perfect. None of us are complete without the fellowship of one another. The texture in the body of Christ is made stronger as we share and tell our stories. 
A word of encouragement, a prayer. Doesn't have to be lengthy. The food is kind of just an excuse to get together. Do you believe that, friends? Have you ever wondered how it is you could make friends? You know, you look at the church and we're, so we come in so quickly and we leave so quickly. It's almost like we're coming to a fire. How soon can we get there? How late can we get there to church? And on the way out, how soon can we leave? And we wonder why we don't know any, anybody. I got just a little suggestion. Slow down. It's Sabbath. Take time to taste the food. You've heard that line in another way, haven't you? Slow down and take time to taste some food at fellowship lunch and get acquainted with somebody. They took time to fellowship, breaking bread together. The next thing they do, did was they continued, what does verse 42 say? The fourth key is they continued in what? In prayer. You can look up prayer in the scriptures, and I challenge you to do that this afternoon. There's a simple acronym from, that, that it comes right, right from the word of Acts. If you will pray continually, and use this acronym in your acronym in your prayers. Acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Did you catch that? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. It goes something like this. Lord, I just come to you and adore you. Not because I'm worthy, but because you are worthy. Father, I have to confess. And tell him what you need to confess. You don't need to confess it to anyone else unless you've harmed somebody. Thanksgiving, I thank you, Father, for the way you blessed me with family. I thank you, Father, for these pieces of growth in my life. And Father, I want to pray for the needs of others and the needs that I have in my life. It's those supplication prayers that take us to the throne of grace. And before your prayers are done, he hears those prayers. And one of my favorite authors says on Sabbath, before the Sabbath hours are out, he hears those prayers and answers those prayers. Prayer is often defined as talking to Christ as you would to a good friend. Opening your heart to Christ as to a good friend. If you're going to grow and be robust, repentance and baptism is the beginning, but it's the teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread together, the prayer that will strengthen you for the onslaughts of everyday life that come our way so frequently. The joy of giving thanks, the joy of being able to go before the Lord. But there's a fifth piece. Um, we're going to look to the fifth key in just a moment. Verse 43. Follow along in your Bibles, Acts chapter 2, verse 43. The Bible says, as they did this, everyone kept feeling a sense of what? A sense of what? Awe and many... Wonders and signs were taking place throughout the apostles. A sense of awe and wonder at what God was doing through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing when you come into the presence of God. It's amazing when you go to a revival service and you find 3,000 people gave their heart to the Lord that day. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? It would be amazing today to have 300 people respond. What is more amazing is when we respond individually, isn't it? So for revival to begin, I want it to begin in my heart, in my life, so that I can say, Lord, my heart and life is filled with a sense of awe and wonder of what you are doing in and through me 
and I'm anticipating what you will do, not because of what I want to do, but because of what you want me to do to take this message to other people. Can you say amen? When the church understands that there is a piece and a part that we have to play in following where God leads, the Holy Spirit will lead and we may need to step out by faith. When we wonder how it is this gospel is going to go to the 200,000 people in Santa Clarita, I got good news for you, friends. God's arm is not short unless yours doesn't move. His lips are not silent unless yours are closed. He is not without a witness unless you are inactive. So how is God going to do it? He's going to do it through you and through me. In such a way that everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and wonder. I think it's a foretaste of heaven, don't you, friends? When the Spirit is poured out. When we sit before the throne of God, it's going to be with a sense of awe and wonder at the majesty of Christ. Now, there's one piece, though, that follows that, because it's, it's really the fifth key. We can have all these other four keys, but it says the signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had, what does the Bible say? And had all things in, in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need, day by day counting with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, and were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity in, house, uh, in heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So with all the awe and wonder, they had all things what? In common. All things in common and they took as they needed, not as they wanted. We have that all turned around. We take as we need, we take as we want, excuse me. We take as we want, and then we think about giving to what's needed. So the fifth key. The fifth key is giving. Giving to others and using our means in ways of helping others. The scripture doesn't command us to place everything we have in common. But it does call us to the accountability of using those things that God has given to us to help others to realize it's only a tool in his hands. For some will say, I'll give of my time, I'll give of my singing voice, I'll serve the Lord. But it stops there. Where would we be as a church? if we do not share one with another. Acts chapter 3. Um, we're going to go there in just a half a minute. I want to share with you one passage from the Joy of Giving, passage from Ellen White. This piece is about a uh, minute and a half long. It talks about the... Cell I, I want to be careful here. I don't know what you give, folks, so I'm talking to myself this morning. You can listen in. Ellen White says there's nothing, say the selfish human heart of man, that lives to itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There's no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but has a ministry. 
Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth the element of life, without which neither man or animal could live, and man and animal in turn minister to the life of the tree and shrub. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty in a blessing to the world. The ocean itself, source of all springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes to give. The mists ascending from the blossom fall into the showers to water the earth that it may bring forth the bud. Angels of glory find their joy in giving, giving love and tirelessly watch gear to souls that are fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of man. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. By gentle, patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into fellowship with Christ, that even closer than they themselves know. God, listen to this, God desires to give us cheerful, willingly, glad. God desires us to give cheerfully, willingly, and gladly. None can keep his law without ministering to others. Happiness is the gift of God to whom, in the spirit of Christ, toils for the good of others. Do you want to experience greater happiness? Help someone today. Doesn't have to be large. Just start. Do you know how to give $100? Do you know how to give $1,000? Start with a dollar. Start with $5. Do you know how to give a million dollars? Start with a dollar. Start with a quarter. You all can give something of your time, your talents, and your means to bless others. So let me ask, friends, do you have more than you need. How many have more than you need? How many of you have stuff in your house? I'm talking about stuff. I'm talking about if you have one, you have two, you have three, and your garage is where you're supposed to park cars and it's full of treasures and stuff. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Probably all of us have more than what we need. And the disciples in the early time of Christ simply were aware of the needs of those around them and realized that we have in community a responsibility to meet the needs of others in a quiet way and hold all the things that Christ has placed in our hands in common for the betterment not only of ourselves but of one another. John chapter 3, uh, in not John, Acts chapter 3, in closing, you find there the healing of a lame beggar. As Peter and John came to the temple in the ninth hour, a man who had been lame for 40 years came up and was begging for alms. In verse 4, But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver or gold. I don't have it. I can't give you any alms. But what I do have, I what? I give to you. It is looking outside of our needs into the lives of others and giving to them, to the common good of others. What I have, I give you. And greater than the alms they could have given him. I love this story. Peter says, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. I could write a sizable check to that man, but I've never had the call of God to heal a man. If I had to choose between the two, I would go with the healing. How about you, friends? Whatever you've given me, God, whether it's quarters or nickels, the gift of teaching, the gift of ministering to children, coming alongside those who are abused, 
Whatever it is, God, whatever you have entrusted to me, you have not given it just for my glory. You have given it to glorify the body of Christ, and I will hold it in common for the common good of all. Then I will grow in the fullness and likeness of Christ. Because in Christ, there is no selfishness. In Christ, there is no hoarding of goodness. In Christ, there is a heart of sharing in benefiting of others. And in verse 10, as he went to the temple, verse 10 of John chapter 3, there was amazement. They were filled with wonder. And that verse says what? Awe. I believe, friends, this is the second half of the greatest day in church history. Baptism, repenting of your sins, and being baptized, yes. But that's the starting block. The fullness is, as we follow in the teachings of the, of the apostles, the fullness is, as we embrace fellowship, the fullness is, as we break bread together. The fullness is as we have a prayer life. The fullness is as we hold our life in common and interact with the body of Christ that we might be blessed and they might be blessed. And we will experience the awe and wonder of the working of the Holy Spirit. May you be blessed this week as you live your lives to the fullest in our Lord Jesus Christ, empowered by his Holy Spirit.